All right, good morning everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning here at my house at Sacrosip Center. My name is Dave Everett, and we're going to be continuing our teaching on being established in righteousness. And as I've said before in previous segments, I think this is lesson number 11, uh, that I divided this teaching into six segments. So we are going to actually be opening and introducing segment number five today, which I have subtitled as the Testimony of Scripture. Okay, so we're talking about uh, being established in righteousness with the subheading for this segment entitled The Testimony of Scripture. Just so you know, all of our teachings are archived. They're on our website at lighthousediscipleship.org as well as our YouTube as well as our YouTube channel, Lighthouse Discipleship Center. We also want to say thank you to all those who have partnered with us with their tithes and their offerings. In case you're wondering how to do so, you can simply go to our website, again, at lighthousediscipleship.org Excuse me. And you can go to the Give page in the top right-hand corner Hit the blue button, and you can give them anywhere around the world. All right, and all the instructions are there. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and get into our teaching this morning. Like I said, I, you know, this teaching being established in righteousness is our the main teaching that we teach here. It's a foundational teaching that we teach in this church that God uh, has revealed to me over the last, uh, uh, I don't know, 12, 15 years, if not more. Okay. And it's a, it's, it's a foundational teaching in my life. It's a foundational teaching in this church. And all the teachings that we teach come are, are built on this foundation. See, like in a house, if the foundation is wrong, everything you build on that is going to be mis misconstrued to a certain point. Okay? And so, if the foundation is good, then chances are that everything you build on that is good too. Now, okay? And there could be some exceptions to some of that. Okay? But at the same point in time, uh, it's a foundational teaching that we teach. And, <coughs> excuse me, through the years, I've actually broken down this teaching into six segments. And this fifth segment that we're going to be introducing this morning, I entitled The Testimony of Scripture. Okay? And so, just a, another, another angle of looking at this being established in righteousness that God gave me. That's why the six segments. <coughs> Excuse me. And at the same point in time, we are building precept upon precept, and I can't just teach this in, in its entirety in just one one teaching. Okay, uh, there's been many uh, angles the Lord has given me the same teaching, and it's it just been very beneficial in my life. It's been very beneficial in many other people's lives. We've seen a lot of people set free from a lifestyle of sin. We see a lot of people come to Christ because of this teaching. We see a lot of people get healed. We see a lot of people. Uh, prosper in their lives in many different ways, not just finances, but not excluding finances either. And so, it's just been very beneficial. And once you know who you are in Christ, once you know that you are in right standing with God because of the blood of Jesus, because you've received Jesus, and you are now the righteous of God in Him, it changes everything. And even if you are tempted to sin, which many of us have, this is the antidote to not go down that road. This is the antidote to get free from sin. Okay, and so, so there's so many different things. So this morning we're going to be introducing segment number five. We're two thirds of the way done with this teaching series. And in time, uh, I have a subtitle for the testimony of scripture. Now where do I get the subtitle the testimony of scripture from? Well, let me answer that. Okay, so we're going to start off this morning from Romans chapter three. We'll be in again verse 20. We've looked at this before many different times in our teaching so far. And we'll continue to look at it a little bit more even in segment number 6. Okay. But here we are, verse tw uh, where, uh, where the subtitle of this teaching comes, comes from verse, verse 21. But let me read the context, talk about it a little bit, and then we'll come back to verse 21. Okay. So Romans 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin, but now, when's now, now, the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. We'll come back to that, okay? Even the righteous God, through faith in, Christ, in Jesus Christ, to all who, to all and on all who believe, but there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And how many times have I heard this? And that's the gospel. This is true. This is biblical. This is true. 
But that's not the gospel. There's no good news in here. The gospel is good news. Okay? There's no good news in here. It's bad, this is bad news. Okay? It's true. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But there's a comma here. So let's finish the sentence. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But we've been justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Am I saying everyone's saved? No. Because not everyone has received this. It's grace. Salvation is grace through faith. It's not grace alone, and it's not faith alone. The grace is free. We've been justified free by His grace. But we have to have put faith in it. The faith, is, the, the faith was talked about in the previous verse. The, the, even the righteous God of God through faith in Jesus Christ. We have to put faith in this amazing grace. Okay? And I, I can pick you back on that, but I, I need to move on. Whom God set forth as a propitiation, a substitute, by his blood, through faith. There's our word faith again. To demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously, <coughs> excuse me, previously committed, whom God set forth as a propitiation, by his blood, through faith, uh, no, excuse me, I read it over again. Because in his forbearance, excuse me, because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed, verse 26, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith. There's a faith again in Jesus Christ. Okay? So, I want to go backwards, but before I go back to where I want to go for this message, I need to, I feel like I just need to I piggyback on a few things here. So let's go backwards one more time, and then I'm going to go back to where I want to go to. So, let's, let's break up this whole passage of Scripture one more time as we've done in previous sessions. By the deeds of the law, no flesh can be justified. You can, and the word justified and the word righteousness are the exact same word. No flesh can be declared. <coughs> I can also say this, and it will be biblically correct by the definition of the word. <coughs> by the deeds of the law, by your performance, you cannot be declared righteous. You cannot be declared righteous by the deeds of the law. No flesh can be justified. I, 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 I see a lot of posts and comments on Facebook and different things where people are saying we can become righteous. We need to become righteous so that we can be just right, justified. That, in other words, they're saying that we need to live holy, live righteously, be separated from the world so that we can be saved. You can't do that without Jesus. You can't be justified by the law. Okay? Until only Jesus can make you holy. Now, am I saying you can live any way you want to? No. You can't, but I'm... I'm see, I'm all for righteousness. Living rightly. I'm all for godliness. I'm all for holiness. I'm all for <laughs> repentance. Where I argue with many religious people... Is how that happens. You walk in the Spirit so you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's not the other way around. You awake to righteousness and said not. The law is, I'm getting ahead of my notes here. The law is good. The law is holy. And the thing that made the law holy is the blood of Jesus. But the law can't make you holy. The law can't make you good. It's called the ministry of death. It's called the ministry of condemnation. It cannot make you holy. By, by keeping the deeds of the law, you cannot be justified. So am I saying we can just live in way we want to? No. You still don't, even though we are under grace, we still don't have any other God besides Him. We still don't murder. We still don't lie and cheat. We still don't commit adultery. Not to become holy, but because... By Christ Jesus, we are holy. Okay. Let's get back to the, the text. 
So therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh can be justified in his in his sight. Now there's a self righteousness, there's a legalistic righteousness, but it's not in his sight. That's a man's sight. Whereby the law is the knowledge of sin. I'll come back to that. <coughs> Excuse me. But now, when's now? And now, right now. The righteousness of God apart from the law. Excuse me. So the righteousness, but now, right now, in this covenant, in this generation, right now, in this era, the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. We'll come back to that. That's the part of where, that's a whole segue to this teaching in this segment. Okay. Even the righteous God through faith in Jesus Christ to all to to all and on all who believe for there's no difference. I already talked about that. While all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption of in Christ Jesus. I've already talked about that. Verse 25. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. God sent Jesus to be the substitute, to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world by his blood. Through faith. His, did his blood take away our sins? Yes. But we have to put faith in his blood, what his blood is. We have to put faith in his grace to demonstrate. God sent forth, we're talking about what God did, not talking about what we did. God set forth as a provision by his blood. God set forth as a provision by his blood through faith to demonstrate his, he's talking about whom? Who's he talking about? He's talking about uh, Jesus Christ. Whom God set forth as a provision by his blood through faith to demonstrate, God demonstrated his righteousness because in his forebearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. What does that mean? I can't fully explain it right now. Okay? But we are in the new covenant. The new covenant didn't start with Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The new covenant started with the cross. Hebrews chapter 7, 8, 9, and 10 talks about this new covenant under a new priesthood, under new laws. Okay? Under new, better, better promises. Okay? But in his forebears, God passed over the sins that were previously committed. Previously committed to what? His blood. Christ. The Old Testament. The Old Testament. Uh, B.C. Before Christ. Was previously committed. God, by his grace, through his forbearance, Passed over the sins that were previously committed. How do you do that? And I don't have time to go into all that. You need to read, really read Hebrews 7, 8, 9, and 10. Through the law, through the Levitical law of sacrifices, that were a shadow, a copy of the real deal, which is in heaven. Through the, through the lambs and bulls and goats, the blood, it was a... When the first Passover took place in... Actually, the book of Exodus, that's where the Passover, Passover lamb came over. We passed over the sins through the blood of the lamb. That was all a typology. That was all a substitute for the real lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In Hebrews chapter 7, 8, and 9, and 10, especially 8, 9, and 10, and the point I'm making right now, talks about how Jesus not only fulfilled the law, he annulled the previous commandment. We are no longer killing bulls and goats and, and, and literal lambs. We, why? Because Jesus died once and for all as our propitiation to demonstrate his righteousness that is going backwards is being revealed now. Okay? But God has, in his forbearance, has passed over the sins that were previously committed for, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus. 
the, the, the Old Covenant is always looking forward, it's a foreshadow, looking to the cross. The New Testament is looking from the cross. Okay? The cross, the gospel, the birth, death, burial, resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus changed everything. And that's what we need to focus on. Okay? That's what he's talking about here. Okay? And so, got this page a little bit out of order, but that's fine. Let's, let's go. Let's go back here. Let's go back to Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of law, no flesh can be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, the right of God, apart from the law, he is revealed. This is what the point I wanted to make. That's why I have this verse here. The law revealed is the knowledge of sin. But the gospel reveals the righteousness of God. The gospel is the power of God to salvation to everyone who is a believer, there's faith. What they're in, they're in what? The gospel is the righteous God revealed. The gospel, the good news, the burial, death, I mean the birth, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. That's a summary of the gospel. If you want to make it short, the burial, death, and resurrection of Jesus reveals the righteousness of God. How do I get that? Because Jesus was our propitiation by his blood to demonstrate his righteousness. To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness. It's repeated twice there, those two verses. That's the same thing here. The gospel reveals the righteousness of God. It demonstrates, it demonstrates the righteousness of God that is now at this present time. Okay, are you following? So again, we either you either so the, the the law is the knowledge of sin, and the gospel is a revelation of righteousness that we are supposed to be experiencing at this present time now. Okay, let's go back here. But now, the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Now that just sounds like an oxymoron. How can the righteousness of God be, 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 be revealed by the law and yet be witnessed by the law? That sounds like you're talking out of both sides of your mouth in one sense. Well, we're going to explain all that. The, the right of God, again, the righteousness of God, the God again, the gospel reveals the righteousness of God. The law reveals sin. And the right of God, apart from the law, is revealed. How is righteousness revealed? It's revealed by the gospel. Right far. We've already established that. But even though it's revealed by the gospel, not from the law, it is being witnessed. It is, what's a witness? If I, in the court system, and I don't know how the court systems work in every, every country, but in this country, it there's a court system, and you are put on the witness stand. When you're on the witness stand, you are going to give a testimony of what you saw, what you heard, what you know, regarding whatever the case is about. Okay? The judge and the lawyers will guide you of how to answer those questions. But you're going to be given a, a witness, a testimony, and you can only give a testimony of the facts that you personally know. Otherwise, it's called heresy. Okay, you can't you can't testify and be a witness to something you didn't witness that you don't know. You can't testify heresy. Okay, now I don't want to go too deep with that. Okay, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole that I don't want to go down. But now the righteous God, apart from the law, is, be, is revealed being witnessed by the law and prophets. The righteousness of God that we're talking about, being established in righteousness, is revealed by the gospel. At the same point in time. And we are not justified by the law. That was already established in the preceding verse. Okay? But the law and prophets do give a testimony 
of this righteousness of God is being revealed now. All scripture. I should have this on the screen. All scripture, and actually it isn't on screen, but further down in my notes for the second. All scripture is proper for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So the man of God might be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I just quoted to you 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture, all scripture is proper for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So that you, the man or woman of God, can be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Until you are indoctrinated and reproved and corrected and trained in righteousness, you are not equipped for every good work. You cannot do good works until you are trained in righteousness. Okay? We established that in the very first segment. We'll talk about the unity, the, the unity of the faith. Okay, that was all pretty much a prelude to where we're, where we're going with this. But, but, it says, but now, <coughs> excuse me, but now the right of God apart from the law is being revealed by the witness, by the testimony of the law and the prophets, otherwise known as Scripture. See, I, I need to make a footnote here. When the Bible specifically in the New Testament when people when writers like Paul or even Jesus or John or James or Peter uses the word scripture they're not talking about the New Testament now you and I we agree that the New Testament is scripture okay let's establish that fact I believe the New Testament Scripture. Okay, repeat after me. Pastor Dave believes the New Testament is Scripture. Okay, I'm probably going to say that slower. Okay. I believe the New Testament Scripture. However, when Paul, James, Peter, John wrote and Jesus spoke as a son of man about Scripture... The New Testament didn't exist yet. Paul didn't write his epistles yet. John or James or Jude, none of these have written, written their letters yet. So when they said that word scripture, the New Testament didn't exist yet. Okay? So, why they said those words when the word scripture was being penned in what we call now the New Testament, let's talk about the law and prophets. Because the Law of the Prophets is a summary of the whole entire Old Testament. Now some of you can argue and say, well, we have the historical books and whatnot. Those still fall underneath the Law of the Prophets. Okay? You can argue that all day you want, but uh, I'm, I'm going with Scripture on this. Okay. So Scripture is Old Testament. In other words, all Scripture... The law and prophets gives testimony to this righteousness apart from the law they reveal. In other words, the law and the prophets testify that righteousness is revealed apart from the law. The law reveals that righteousness is revealed. I mean, let, I, let me I misstate that. The law testifies that the righteous of God being revealed is apart from its own self. The law says you can't be justified by the law. Okay? And so, anyway, we'll get there. But this phrase right here, being witnessed by the law of the prophets, is what this, se this, this segment is entitled, the testimony of Scripture. Let's look at our first one. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 1. We might hear during our first segment. Let's look at it again. God, I wonder who he is, right? God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. What's he saying so far? God has always been speaking. God has been has spoken at various times and various ways 
throughout history, throughout ancient history, to the, our forefathers by the prophets. But he has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. God and, and God has always been speaking. And in times past, he's been speaking to us, to our forefathers. What we know is the uh, written Old Testament, the law and the prophets. He spoke to us by the prophets. But you have these last days, and we've been in the last days since Jesus rose from the dead and descended to the right hand of majesty on high. He's spoken to us by his son. God used to speak to us by the prophets. And I'm not saying there's not New Testament prophets. But God is now speaking to us by his son. Whom? Who's whom? The son. <coughs> whom God, he has appointed heir of all things, to whom also he made the world. Okay, so right now he's elaborating, we're in verse 2, of who this Jesus is. This Jesus created the worlds. He's the heir of all things, he's created the worlds. Who being the brightness of his glory, and express image of his person. So in other words, Jesus' son is the express image of the Father, God. Okay, you've seen the, you've seen the son, you've seen the Father. He's the express image of his person, capital P, God, okay? And the Son is upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's powerful. God has always been speaking at various times, various ways, and he's spoken to us in previous times by his Father. He's now, in these last days, speaking to us by his Son, who's the heir of all things. He's the creator of all, he's creator of all things. He's the express image of the Father, and he upholds all things by the word, singular. This is not plural, by the word of his power, when he himself purged our sins. In other words, God is upholding all things. By the power of one single word. And that word is when he purged our sins. The very specific word that God is upholding all things. The creator of the universe. The express image of the Father. Is upholding all things. Is when he by, had by himself purged our sins. And... So right now we see the, the, the death of Jesus and now the, the ascension of Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty of high. It's one of the main reasons why the ascension is part of the gospel. Okay. Maybe you know what I mean by saying that. Okay. Um, sorry, I just lost a thought. So, in other words, if Jesus didn't purge our sins, I used to teach that we would just all turn to, turn to goo. Because he's upholding all things by the word of his power when he purged our sins. And if he didn't purge our sins, every, everything that he created would just turn to goo. That's how I used to teach it. My wife corrected me. said, we wouldn't turn to goo. We would just vanish. We just would not exist anymore. It'd be like the Lord of the Rings when Bilbo put on that ring. Poof. Gone. We wouldn't just be invisible. We would not exist anymore. Poof. Gone. Okay? And so, there's a very specific word that God has spoken very times. He's now speaking to us by his son, and that is that he purged our sin. It was witnessed. He's spoken to many, many times throughout history to the prophets. But he's now speaking this specific word to us by his son. When he himself purged our sins. Okay. That, 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 that win is powerful. 
Because that's the part, word of his power that he's talking about, that he's always been speaking. He's now speaking to us in these last days about his son. And his son is not in the grave. His son is on the right hand of his majesty on high. Okay. Let's move forward. These two, this verse was more of a prelude again to where I'm going. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Again, we're talking about, let me go back real quick, being the witness of the law, the testimony of Scripture. Okay, now let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We'll begin at verse 14. But their minds, who's he talking about? To those in the Old Testament. Okay, we're blinded, for until this day the same bell remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. What's the Old Testament? The Law and the Prophets. Okay, you follow me so far? Because that's what we're talking about, the testimony of Scripture. Scripture specifically being the Old Testament. Okay? In this context. But their minds were blighted, for until this day the same bell remains. I looked at the, the reading of the Old Testament. What did he just say before that? We're, we picked up verse 14. But he, and we'll look at the verses in just a few moments. But he's comparing the ministry of the... He's, he's re, comparing the ministry of death and condemnation... With the ministry of, <coughs> of righteousness and the ministry of the Spirit. He said the ministry of condemnation and death that was written on stone, and there was only one thing that was written on stone, that's the Ten Commandments. Had glory, but the ministry of the Spirit and the ministry of righteousness seeds much more in glory. And after he talks about that, he, he goes into, but their minds were blinded. Their minds were blinded. And we, we talked about this already earlier in our study. Okay. That their minds were blinded. And they were blinded by, their minds were blinded by a veil. What's the veil? The Old Testament. The law. And the prophets. Because the veil is taken away in Christ. There's only one way to remove this veil, this blinding veil, and that is to Receive Christ. Only Christ can remove that veil. But even to this day, when's, when's this day? Right now. We've already established that so far. Let's go back here. But now, we even, even back here, um, this present time. But now, okay, I should have highlighted in yellow, but until this day, when Moses is read, that's the law of the prophets. A veil lies on their hearts. Verse 16. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. There's only, you know, you can dice this any way you want to, but the Old Testament, according to the Word of God, according to the New Testament, is a veil. That will blind your hearts. And there's only one way to remove that veil, and that's to turn to the Lord. Only in Christ is that veil taken away. Okay. See, the Jews miss the message amid the laws and the commandments. They understood the letter of the law, but they missed the spirit of the law. They missed the message. Many of the Jews, especially in Jesus' day, the scribes, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they knew the letter of the law. They even added some amendments to that. But they miss the spirit of the law. Why? Because their minds are blinded. Okay. Got quiet in the Presbyterian house. The revealing the law serves as a Veil that will blind your hearts. But the same veil remains. When Moses was read. It remains unlifted in the original testament. You and I, our own hearts could be blinded if all we read is the law. 
here. We're going to unpack this. If you stay with us, we're going to unpack this. There's a mystery in this law that's now revealed to us called Christ, the hope of glory. We're going to get that. It was concealed. Christ was concealed in the Old Testament, but he's revealed in the New Testament. It's a foreshadow. But unless you know the spirit of the law, not just the letter of the law, it will serve as a veil. Are you following me? Are you making sense? If you don't understand the spirit of the Old Testament, it will serve as a veil and will burn your hearts. You need the Holy Spirit. You need the New Testament. To reveal the mystery of the old covenant. That is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay. See, a veil can serve as a deception, as a delusion, as a blindness of the mind. This veil blinded their minds, but it also blinded their hearts. I'm trying to. Um, a veil lies on their hearts. It's the very last line here. Okay. In other words, when you view Scripture, and we are in the New Testament, we are in this day, we are in the. But now. We are in the last days. We are in the present time. Okay. But, see, you can, when you view scripture, specifically the Old Testament, but when you view scripture, what law, what lens <coughs> are you reading it from? Are you reading it with the Old Testament, Old Covenant mentality that serves as a veil, that blinds your mind and blinds your heart? Or have, have you got a revelation of the gospel that reveals righteousness? That this veil removes this veil. And therefore, you are seeing through, whether you read the Old Testament or New Testament, you see nothing but Christ, the hope of glory. See, the veil, this veil, can either witness, give testimony to your mind and to your heart, this righteousness that they reveal, or it can serve as a veil to blind your mind and blind your heart. It depends what lens you have on. It depends if you have a veil over your mind and your heart. And there's only one way to remove that veil. And that is to receive Christ. Because only by Christ is the veil taken away. There's only one way. I can't argue with you. I can't convince you. I can't twist your arm. I can't force you to see this. It's by revelation of the Holy Spirit alone. And by, <coughs> by receiving Christ that this veil is taken away. But some of you, you've received Christ. But you still have a veil over your heart because you've got to let your theology, the letter of the law, get in the way of the spirit of the law. And you need to allow Christ to remove this veil from your mind, from your heart. I can't do that for you. I can lead you to it. I can introduce you to it. I can teach it to you. But this comes by revelation from the Holy Spirit. Remember, when Jesus had a conversation with his disciples, and he asked them, who do you say I am? And some said, well, some say you're a great teacher, and this and that. And then Peter, who's always a loud mouth, spoke up and said, you are the Christ. And Jesus said, this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by the Holy Spirit. I can teach it to you. I can show you. But you can only get a revelation of what I'm teaching to you by the Holy Spirit. Okay. See, again, you know, it seems like we're bashing the law. 
We call it the Ministry of Condemnation Death. I didn't call it that scripture did, and we'll have those scriptures on the voice on the, on the screen in a moment. We're saying it blinds your mind and it blinds your heart. Okay? Seems like we're bashing the law. The law has a its purpose, and we'll get to some of that. The law is good, the law is holy, but the law can't make you holy and good. The law doesn't grade on the curve. The law the law doesn't have grace. The law doesn't have mercy. There's no gray area with the law. It's black or red. The law says you sin, you die. There's no mercy. There's no forgiveness. There's no forgiveness of the law. The law, the law can't forgive you. The law can only judge you. And if you're breaking one aspect of the law, you've broken the whole thing. It's like, you know, if I shoot a BB gun through a glass window, it doesn't matter if there's a little hole or if the whole thing's been shattered. It's broken. Okay? The law cannot make you holy. By the deeds of the law, no flesh can be justified. There's nothing you can do. Even if you do all the good deeds of the law after you sin, you still can't be justified by it. The law is a ministry of condemnation. It's a ministry of death. We'll get to that scripture in a few moments. It's a, you who have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by the law. By attempting to be justified by the law, you become estranged from Christ. You fall from his grace. The King James says, you have, Christ becomes no effect unto you. Whosoever are justified, who attempt to be justified by the law, you fall from grace. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. Three times, three times, Paul had to address that thought. But the thing I like about that is that when you and I teach the gospel, if this question doesn't come up, then we're not preaching the gospel the way Paul did. Because three times Paul had to address such a question. And if I preach the gospel in such a way, this question should come up. The answer is always certainly not. God forbid. No. But the question should come up. If that question does not come up when you preach the gospel, then you did not preach the gospel the way Paul did. Because that question kept coming up over and over. Is the law against the promise of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which you could have been given life through truly righteous Truly righteousness would have come by the law. If you could be made righteous by keeping the law, then the law would have given you that opportunity. But it couldn't happen. It couldn't happen. But the scripture, and we're talking about the testimony of scripture, but the scripture has combined all under sin. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The scripture, the law, has confined all under sin. That the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. That's awesome. We think our religious minds think this is a bad thing. Jesus, God, set it up this way as a good thing. If the is there a law against the promise of God? No. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, forgiveness, mercy, or even life itself, truly righteousness would have been given by the law. But the scripture has combined all under sin. There's nobody. We all deserve hell. We all deserve the penalty of sin, which is death. We've all failed. All of us. And by the deeds of the law, you can't be justified. You can't be saved. The law. The law doesn't give you a way to be righteous. 
The law is not against the promise of God. The law, the scripture, has combined all sin. We're not against the law. But the law says you are a sinner, you die. If all we have is the law, we have no hope. If we have all we have is the law, we are all looking toward hell. There is no salvation. There is no hope. The law is holy, it's good, but it cannot save you. It can only tell you, you mess up, you're a sinner, and you must pay for that. But script, the same scripture, the same scripture, has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus might be given. Why is that so? Because God, the God of mercy, made it so. It's called grace. It's called mercy. You cannot earn grace. You cannot earn mercy. Otherwise, it's not grace and it's not mercy. His mercies endure. Many of us, we've been enamored with the law, but we have not been introduced to the mercy of God. When, when Moses, in the book of Exodus, I think, I think it's chapter 34, when he asked, I want to see your glory, and he had Mo Moses in the cleft of the rock, and God passed before him. It said all of his goodness, all of his grace, all of his mercy passed before him. The true nature of God is mercy and goodness and grace and forgiveness and long suffering. God did this. The scripture has combined all understand that the promises of God, the promise by faith in Jesus, might be given to those who believe. That's awesome. The law is holy. The law is good. But even the law, even this three-letter word called the law, was made holy by the blood. The only thing that can make anything holy is the blood. Even the law itself. What made the law holy? The blood. What makes anyone holy? The blood. The blood of Jesus. The blood of the Lamb of God. At Hebrews chapter 9. For whether it is a testament or a covenant, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is not in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. See, a lot of us, we don't understand Christianity because we don't understand testament. We don't understand covenant. We don't understand the difference between the old covenant and the new testament, and new covenant. And many of us are trying to put the old covenant into the new covenant. And the, Jesus said, that's like putting old, 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 uh, old wine into new wineskins. Or new wine into old wineskins. I had it backwards. Excuse me. And when you try to put new wine into old wineskins, the wineskins burst. And both are lost. You cannot mix the two covenants. Hebrews chapter 7 said that we're under a new priesthood with new laws. The priesthood of the Levitical priesthood was under Levi, the tribe of Levi. But the priesthood of Jesus, the new priest, is under the tribe of Judah. Two different tribes, two different priesthoods. After the order of now Kesedek, a king priest. See, under the law, you couldn't be a king and a priest. 
that's the issue when you read the story of King Saul and he, he lost his kingship because he tried to be a king priest. He disobeyed Samuel. He disobeyed the word of the Lord. But in the in Hebrews chapter 7 it says, Jesus, our new high priest, is our king and he is our priest. And he's made us kings and priests. Revelation chapter 5 verses 9 and 10. Peter also talks about how we are a royal priesthood. Royal priesthood. Royal kingship. Priesthood. Anyway. Gotta move forward. But where there's a see a covenant, and therefore a covenant, I like the word covenant, but in this case I like the word testament because a testament has a testator. What's a testator? If my father has a will, that will does not go into effect until he dies. That will still may be legal, but it has no power while he's still alive. Now, I don't want my father to die for the will to become effective. But that will has no effect while he's still alive. That's why when there's a death in the family, and the family member has a will, there's a process, a legal process, for that includes that they need a death certificate to prove that the testator died. For that will, that testament, to become in force. And once the legal process has been verified, authenticated, that the testator died, that testament is now in force. Jesus is not just our birth certificate. He's not just our marriage certificate. He is also our death certificate. And because Jesus died, the te New Testament is in full force. It might be of Star Wars, but the Death Star is fully activated. It looked like it was still a work in progress, but it was still fully activated. Activated, it was fully enforced that the testament, New Testament of Jesus Christ, the covenant of His blood, is in full force. That's not where I'm going because that's just a preview. Verse 18. Therefore, not even the first covenant. What's the first covenant? The law, the law of the prophets, was dedicated without blood. What am I talking about? Why are we going here in Hebrews? We're talking about. I'm going to go back real quick. We're talking about the testimony of Scripture. Okay, that's what we're talking about. Ultimately, we're talking about being established in righteousness. But in this segment, we're talking about the testimony of Scripture. But he says, you, um, not even the old first covenant was dedicated without blood. We're also talking about, I made the point that the law is good and holy. But what made it holy? The blood. The first covenant was dedicated with blood. What made it holy? What made the first covenant holy? The blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people, <coughs> according, excuse me, according to the law, that should have been highlighted reading, he took the blood of cows and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and the people. The law is holy. What made it holy? The blood. And I, I get so many arguments on people with Facebook. They want to become holy by what they do, by keeping the law. And what made the law holy? The blood. There's so many comments and so many posts by so many well-meaning pastors, and I want to say that they're, they're well-meaning, but they bypass the most important ingredient, the blood of Jesus. You can't have the New Testament. You can't have salvation. You can't have grace. You can't have holiness that you're fighting for without the blood of Jesus. I'm not saying, I'm not endorsing people to be living in sin. I'm trying to get you free from it. And the only way you can be free from sin is Jesus. Stop putting faith in you and put your faith in the cross of Jesus Christ. Because when you put your faith in you instead of Jesus, 
That's the spirit of Antichrist. I'm not judging you, but the word Antichrist, and Christian means against or instead of Christ. And you are putting your faith in you instead of Christ. That's Antichrist. I'm not judging you. I'm just calling a spade what it is, a spade. Have I become your enemy now that I, I, I speak the truth to you? And I speak it in love, not judgment. There's no malice, there's no spite. I'm trying to help you, not hurt you. But the only thing that's going to make you holy is the blood of Jesus. So you say we can live any way we want to? Where did that come from? No! I'm trying to make you holy so you can live holy. You can't live holy with, on your own initiative. Temperance is a fruit of the Spirit. It's not a fruit of the flesh. You can't become holy. You can't live holy without Jesus living in you. I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who loved me. In the life I live, I live by the faith of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the blood. Amen. Amen. So the first covenant was dedicated with the blood. Saying this, the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. Paul echoes this in Corinthians when he talks about communion. He calls it the blood of the covenant. <coughs> Excuse me. King James says, I love this. I'm reading from the New King James in most of my scriptures. This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. The, New King, the King James says, this is the blood of the, covenant of the testament which God has enjoined unto you. I love that. Excuse me. Verse 21. Then likewise, so he, 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 he sprinkled the book itself on the people, and then likewise, he sprinkled, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and the vessels of the ministry, and according to the law, almost all things are purified with the blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Therefore, it was necessary. I mean, you know, sorry, I got a pause for a moment. I'm talking with one pastor recently. He says the only reason God made Jesus available is because some people can't couldn't afford the lamb. That is ludicrous. <laughs> that is false doctrine to the high school. Jesus is not a substitute for the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant it was a substitute for Jesus until the true Lamb of God came. He got it backwards, big time. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies, the copies, the copies, the Old Testament and the copies of the things in the heavens should be, pur should be purified. See, all these Levitical things were copies, and they had to be purified by blood. With these. But the heavenly things, the true things themselves, were better sacrifices than these. What's the better sacrifice? The blood of Jesus. Okay. Hopefully, you've given something out of this. Without the shed of blood, there is no remission, and all things are made holy only by the blood, even the book. Also. Okay, how are we get on time? Okay, guys, some time left. Let's go to Colossians. If indeed you continued in the faith, see that, that's that word faith again, grounded and steadfast and not moved away from the hopes of the God, hope of the gospel, which you heard, which was preached to every creature from the heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Verse 24, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. For the sake of his body, he's talking about the church, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship of God. There's so many things I can pick it back on to. I'm refining myself. Which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Okay? Go on. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, he's talking about the Old Testament, 
but now, there's that word, that phrase again, but now, has been revealed to his saints. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I should have had it on the screen again real quick here, but let's go back real quick. Apologize for going back, but we're talking about Talking about, but now, the righteous of God revealed apart from the law being written by the law and the prophets. Okay, that's what we're talking about. Let's get back to where we were. Okay. This has been a mystery which has been hidden from the ages. We're talking about the law and from generations. The same, the same mystery that was spoken. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at various times and various ways spoken, but now spoken just by faith by son. Okay. I should have coordinated these slides a little better. Just apologize for that. This mis the mystery, which has been hidden from all ages, spoke from ages, not all ages, because it's not hidden now, and from generations, but now has been revealed. To them, God will to make known to who? To who? Yeah, us. God has will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, Christ we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. To this end, I am also labor striving according to his working which works in me. This, the, the, God, the mystery was hidden in the Old Testament. It's revealed to his saints in the New Testament. And this mystery, what is the mystery? Christ in you, the hope of glory. And someone else on Facebook this week wanted to argue about Christ in you. Saying that's not, that's not a true statement. That's the mystery. That's the gospel. Anyway, I can't go down that rabbit trail. That we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. What's this? Being justified. Being declared righteous. Because of the blood of Jesus that he demonstrated on the cross. <coughs> I hate going back again. But going back to what we already talked about. His propitiation to demonstrate his righteousness, so to demonstrate at the present time, his righteousness, that he might be just and to justify those who have faith in Jesus. I hope I'm not losing you by going back and forth like this, I apologize, but I'm really trying to connect the dots for you. For some of you just, you know, uh, he, he, got, he got the law, a blinding bell, blinding your hearts, that we may present every man perfect in Christ. Where did we hear this before? We shared this several weeks from Thessalonians that for fact, that was lacking in your faith. For all scripture is possible for, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So the man of God might be perfected for every good work. That's how the King James says it. Okay? There's, per, there's a perfection. There's a perfection going on. He wants to reveal Christ in you, the hope of glory. He wants to reveal to you this mystery so that you can be perfected in Christ. You're not perfected outside of Christ. You're not perfected. This is not self-righteousness. No, this is called Christ's righteousness. I share this with some people and they think I'm, I'm just a self-righteous person. No, I'm talking about Christ's righteousness. Self has died. I've died. I'm crucified with Christ. I die daily. I reckon myself to be dead of sin to my own nature. And I'm alive to God in Christ Jesus, Romans 6 11. I'm not claiming self righteousness. I didn't do anything that was grace and mercy. I just believe the gospel. Okay. Paul 
saying, we are sharing this gospel, this mystery with you. That was a mystery, but now it's revealed to you, Christ, and you have glory. That we may present every man perfect in Christ. Paul's goal is to, is to present every man perfect in Christ. His goal, he, could, he was praying night, night, day, so he could perfect what was lacking in their faith. That's been Paul's goal. There's nothing different here. Just the, different, the wording of how he said it, how he phrased it. <coughs> Let's look at another one. Hebrews chapter 12. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. Now, Mount Zion is not, it's not Mount Sinai. Mount Zion. To an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly, and church of the firstborn. Church of the firstborn. Jesus is the firstborn of many brethren. He's the firstborn. Who are registered in heaven? To God, the judge of all, to the spirit of just men. There's that phrase again, made perfect. What perfect? The same perfect he talked about. That we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That I might perfect that which is lacking in faith. And then I give you many more examples. To Jesus Christ, the mediator of the what? New covenant. And this new covenant speaks better things, the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. We know the story of Abel and Cain, how his blood spoke out for vengeance. Well, the blood of Jesus speaks better things. Why, why am I going into these verses? Because I'm answering the question, what made the law holy? The blood of Jesus. Let's look at one more. Romans 16. Now to him, talk about Jesus, who is able to establish you according to the gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. God and God alone. Is a, we're talking about being established in righteousness, folks. Specifically, we're now in the end on the testimony of Scripture. But we're talking about being established. He is able to establish you according to the gospel. Why does Paul call it my gospel? It's the gospel of Christ. But I don't know about you, but I've adopted it too. It was preached to me. It is preached to you. You can all adopt this. Because my gospel is his gospel. Okay? Don't get messed up on the pronoun. Okay? And the preaching of Jesus Christ. According to the revelation of the mystery. What's the mystery? Christ and you the hope of glory. Kept secret since the world began. It was kept secret in the Old Testament. It was concealed. But it's revealed to you. Verse 26. But now. Okay. We, 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 we got to the vote now too. God is, God is the only one who is able to establish you according to the gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. According to the revelation of the mystery. This Old Testament. We're talking about the testimony of Scripture. That was kept secret since the world began. The testimony of Scripture being testified, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. But now. He has made man. And by the prophetic scriptures, that the testimony of scriptures made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, for obedience to the faith. There's so much here. I'm really just picking back on the same point over and over again, many different angles, many different ways of saying the same thing. And I can pray that only by the Holy Spirit you get a revelation of what I'm trying to teach to you. try to finish this point and then, uh, then it will pick up next week. See, I say many times in this church we are not religious. We are, we have a relationship with God. I hate religion. I hate the word religion. I hate anyone calling me religious. And anytime anyone, I don't care who you are, calls me religious, I will correct you. Um, that, that is that's almost like you call me an Ishmael instead of an Isaac. It just, um, you call me the older brother instead of the prodigal. I'm the prodigal who came home. I'm not the older brother who not only rejected the, not only rejected his brother, but he rejected the father. He would not even fellowship with the father. Okay. 
But even though I'm against religion, and specifically Christian religion, Christian religion who's trying to be justified by the law. And when you're trying to be justified by the law, look at Galatians 5 4, we become. We become estranged from Christ. We make Christ of no effect. Trying to be justified by the law, that's why I call it being religious. We fall from grace. Okay? That's what I'm talking against. Let's get to where we were. But even though that is the message of religion. And I, I'm totally against it. Religion, Christian religion for the most part, its motive is to be good. I, I voice many Facebook posts and conversations and maybe other conversations outside of Facebook that I've been in disagreement with. That I've been appalled by. But even though that's true, and, my, and, and, and for the most part I'm against the message behind some of these conversations or posts or whatnot, the motive behind most of these posts and these people, these men and women die, is good. They really want to see people get saved. They really want to see people go to heaven. They really want to see people live holy and right and good. The motive is good. Are you following me? Okay. They're not wicked. They're not, they're not trying to be mean and malicious and spiteful and, and whatnot. Their motive is good to get people to be holy and repent and be righteous. But the message is wrong. The motive is good, but the message is wrong. Because the message is you becoming holy on your own means. And you can't do it. The gospel alone reveals his righteousness. You cannot be justified. This is our main scripture for this segment. You can't be justified by the law. The righteousness of God is revealed apart from the law. But it's been witnessed by the, the spirit of the law. Gives witness. The letter of the law you can't be justified. And a lot of people, religious people, they mean well, but they can't distinguish between the letter of the law and the, the spirit of the law. That's what the Pharisees had a hard time with. Okay? There's only, again, there's only one way to remove this veil. And that is in Christ. There's only one way to remove the veil. And that is in Christ. I'm not bashing religious people. I'm bashing the message. <coughs> Some people are going to be offended. I get that. So with the Pharisees. So is the, so is the prodigal older brother. The prodigal older brother was offended by the father. But there's only one way to remove the veil. I can't argue it. I can't teach it. I can lead you to it. But you have to turn to the Lord. You have to turn to Christ. And so I will preach Christ. I will preach the good news. The gospel. That reveals the righteousness of God. I can't get I can't get you there because I debate with you. I can only get you there by preaching Christ to you, and you turn to the Lord. See, true humility is trusting and relying on the cross. True, true humility is trusting God and God alone. True humility is trusting and relying on. The blood of Jesus and the blood of Jesus alone. Pride is trusting yourself. Pride is relying on your own performance. Go back here. 
by your own deeds. Trying to be justified by the law and making Christ of no effect to you. Pride is striving in your own performance to become righteous. And it's a, it's a fool's errand. I want people to get free from sin too. Just like the religious teachers who are teaching. Where I defer on, where I disagree on, is how that happens. I'm not advocating for a life of sin. I'm advocating to be free from sin. But where I argue is how that happens. Because how religious people teach it, they're actually keeping people in bondage. Because the only way to remove it is for preach Christ and for people to turn to the Lord. Because where the Spirit where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. This is in context of saying our ministry is not the ministry of condemnation and death. Our ministry is the ministry of righteousness, the ministry of the Spirit. And where the Spirit is, where righteousness is, there is freedom. So I'm preaching true humility, trusting God and God alone, the, the blood of Jesus and the blood of Jesus alone. I'm teaching true freedom that can only be found in the Spirit of God. And I'm teaching true transformation because we all, with our unveiled face, how do you remove the veil? Turn to the Lord. With our unveiled we are beholding, and that's our last segment we'll be titled Behold, as in the mirror of the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. What image? The image of righteousness. The image of the Spirit. From glory, from the glory of the New Covenant to the glory of the Old Testament. Just at, from the glory of the Old Testament to the glory of the New Testament, excuse me. Just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Just as by the righteousness of God. you got to keep this in context. He just talked about the, the ministry of the Spirit with the ministry of righteousness. He just compared that. He compared the ministry of the law with the, we talked about, he compared the glory of the law with the glory of the ministry of righteousness, the glory of the ministry of the Spirit. Well, I'll show you in just a second. But until we ha our face is unveiled, and we are beholding as in a mirror, what's a mirror? A mirror, a mirror is not a window. A mirror is a reflective device. When I look in the mirror, I see myself. But when I behold as in the mirror, the Bible says in James that the word of God is like a mirror. So it, our, when we are in Christ, we are born again. So what does our, my born again nature look like? I can't see it in the physical. I can't see physically my born again nature. I can only see my born again nature in the word of God. And when we behold, see with the mind, when I, we gaze, focus, behold, as in the mirror, the glory of the Lord. God asked me this several years ago. When I look, when I look in the mirror, who do I see? I said, when I look in the mirror, I don't know about you, but I see me. I don't see nobody else unless they're behind me and we're doing a selfie together. We, uh, I see myself. And I knew I answer, answered the question wrong when God asked me the question again. When we look in the mirror, we see, should see the glory of the Lord. Why? Because he made us righteous by his blood. I'm not righteous because of what I've done. I'm righteous because of what he's done. And I believed it and I received it. Some people say it can't be that simple, Pastor Dave. It is. Remember our last segment. When Paul said, I fear with get godly jealousy. That you will hear another gospel. And that would take you from the simplicity that's in Christ. I'm paraphrasing. I think it's 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2, 3, and 4. But we are, when we, when we look in the mirror, when we behold in the mirror the glory of the Lord, we are transformed like a butterfly, from a caterpillar to a butterfly, or a tadpole to a frog. We are transformed into the same image. What image? The image that we're beholding in the mirror. When we, when we look at the Word of God in the mirror and we behold His glory, not our glory, excuse me, we are transformed into that same image. 
from glory to glory, from the glory of the old covenant to the glory of the new covenant, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. <coughs> what I mean by the Spirit of the Lord? He just talked about the, the ministry of the Spirit, the ministry of righteousness, had much more glory than the glory of the old covenant. And we are transformed from glory to glory by the ministry of righteousness, by the ministry of the Spirit. And I'm going to conclude with these last thoughts. See, I believe because this is true. Okay? And this is all subsequent to what he just said. But the very next verse, the very next verse, he says, verse chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, because this is true, therefore, since we have this ministry. What ministry? What does this have to do with ministry? Are you following me? <coughs> he says this, and in the very next verse, therefore. Therefore is always prerequisite. Therefore, I'm sorry, is always subsequent to what's therefore. Therefore, since we have this ministry. What ministry? The ministry he just talked about in verses 7 and 8 that I've been talking about all along. He compared the ministry of death and condemnation with the ministry of the Spirit and the ministry of righteousness. This ministry of the Spirit is what he was talking about here. It's what he was talking about here. Okay? And it's what he was talking about here. Because our ministry is not the ministry of death and condemnation, the law. And in case, you're mess, in case you're confused on that, the ministry of death written in the grave on stones. There's only one ministry that did that. That's the Ten Commandments. Okay. And in case you're, you're confused, more confused, he said Moses. Okay. He says that this ministry had glory. But the ministry of the Spirit is more glorious. The ministry of condemnation had glory, but the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. And that's what he's talking about here when he says from glory to glory. Okay? And so this ministry, what ministry? We are under the ministry of the Spirit and the ministry of righteousness. Also, this is chapter 3, but verse five, chapter 5 is called the ministry of reconciliation. These three things, the ministry of reconciliation and ministry of righteousness, and the ministry of spirit is our ministry. Okay? What is not our ministry is the ministry of death and the ministry of condemnation, which is the law. Okay? But our ministry is the ministry of these three things we say. Therefore, even if the gospel is bound, what's the bound? The law. It is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. What do you mean God's blinded the mind? No, Lord G, Satan, the God of this age has blinded. Who do not what? There's that faith again. Believe. Lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Who is in the God? The gospel is a who. The gospel is a who. And should shine. See, unless we preach the gospel that reveals the righteousness of God, people are perishing. Okay? And the enemy is blinding their minds from hearing the gospel. He's blind. It's bound. He's trying to bound their minds. Okay? And with this last scripture, Colossians 2, 11. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the circumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the head written writing requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, 
and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding festivals or a new moon or Sabbath. What's all this law? Don't judge. Don't let anyone judge you according to the law. Why? He nailed it to the cross. He made your lives together. <coughs> Have you forgiven you all trespasses? All trespasses, past, present, and future. And some of you might say, argue, saying, how can God forgive me future sins I haven't committed yet? You better believe that he did, because all of your sins were future when he died on the cross. Jesus died once. He's not dying again. Okay? Having wiped out the handwriting and requirements that was against us, he has taken it out of the way by nailing it to the cross. This ministry, the ministry of condemnation and death, was against us. It was contrary to us. And he took it out of the way by nailing it. He fulfilled it. He nailed it to the cross. And we are now alive together with him, having been forgiven. We are truly righteous. These handwriting requirements that were the testimony of scriptures, they were also against us. Why? Because I think I have it here. Because they have the knowledge of sin. We can't be justified by them. The right of God, apart from the law. Why is it apart from the law? Because he nailed it to the cross. He fulfilled it. Okay? He fulfilled it. And if you read Hebrews chapter 7, he didn't denote it. It's denoted. Okay? And so, I didn't say that. He, the writer of Hebrews said that. Argue with him. Okay? And so anyway, um, there's a lot more I need to say and want to say. We'll pick it up here next week. We'll recap a few things that I've shared already in this segment as we keep talking about, excuse me, being established in righteousness and specifically in this study, the testimony of Scripture. I hope you got some things out of this. I hope this helps you out. I want to see you free from sin. I'm not sweeping sin under the carpet. I'm saying that Jesus took your sin, became your sin, and he crucified it. And buried it. Not so that you can just live any way you want to, but so that you can be free from sin. And live a holy, righteous life. That God has ordained for you before Adam ever messed it up. Wait, God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.